Um, okay, so this was the quiz that was largely over the French Revolution. Uh, so, here we go. One of the questions you might have seen was true or false. Is it more accurate to think of the French Revolution as a series of revolutions and counter-revolutions by competing factions? True or false? It is more accurate. True, true, it is. It is, we talked about that. There were, there was the, generally the historiography is broken up into three approximate periods of, of revolution. That is the revolution of, of, 18, of uh, 1789, which was the liberal political revolution, and then uh, 1792, which was the uh, radical social revolution, and then you had uh, the directory uh, in uh, 95, uh, which eventually transforms into the consulate, which transforms into the empire, but those were all uh, effectively the same sorts of people, uh, sort of centrist, um, landed elite types who, who wanted, uh, you know, the, the, the modernization that came with political revolution, uh, but weren't exactly picky about the form the government took. Another true or false. Under Napoleon, as a general rule, the old French nobility living in exile were not permitted to return to France. That was false. That was false. They could return, and they could even have their old lands back, but they just had to pay for them. Um, this was one of the big changes of the, of the revolution uh, and of the Napoleonic Empire. Even when the Bourbons come back, you are not going to be able to pull out some old feudal land claim and say, well, uh, my family traces uh, possession back to uh, King Louis IV and uh, you know, he gave this title to us for service in this or that conflict. That doesn't play anymore. That doesn't play anymore. You can have as much land as you want, but you have to pay for it. So it's becoming a bourgeois, modern state kingdom rather than a feudal one. Multiple choice. This radical revolutionary figure is most closely associated with the reign of terror. That was Maximilien Robespierre. Another multiple choice. This French king lost his head during the French Revolution. That was Louis XVI. Sorry about that, Louis. Question five. This Corsican corporal eventually would have himself crowned Emperor of France. That, of course, was Napoleon. How many estates was the Estates General comprised of? It was three. There was the nobilities, the clergy, and then everyone else. And the everyone else was largely uh, spoken for by the commercial class. Napoleon's greatest mistakes plural, invading Russia, trusting Talleyrand, toppling the Spanish monarchy, it was all of the above. Invading Russia, pretty self-explanatory. Trusting Talleyrand, he was the foreign minister who was going behind his back um, to the Russians, actually, and the British. And then toppling the Spanish monarchy, um, this opens up a continual guerrilla warfare uh, campaign there, and the British are actually going to land um, the, the fellow who will eventually become the Duke of Wellington. He'll land there and, and cause endless problems, so. There you have it, that was the quiz. As I said, uh, the class average was, was uh, just a tad over 90, 90%, so no problems there. Of course, you'll see all of those questions on the exam next month, uh, plus a few others. Uh, if you'll recall, just very briefly, um, the last time we met, right before break, um, we had done uh, the end of that uh, Aloso and Williford chapter, on a combination, it's kind of a tying up chapter. Um, I'll actually pull it up uh, on here really quickly just so that I can kind of breeze through this real quick to kind of refresh your memory because we're gonna actually leave Europe uh, for this lecture and probably most of uh, Thursday's lecture as well because we have to catch up uh, and talk, well, really tie in the other um, regional narrative arcs that we were building up in the first several weeks of class. If you remember these, these regarded Central Asia, um, the, the subcontinent, India, China, we need to tie those uh, in to the narrative that we've been building. So, so and Williford.
resolutions of 1848. Yes, we had talked about these. And this. Yeah, this okay, so we talked about the resolutions of 1848. The period of 1815 to 1848, there's not really going to be war between the European powers. The powers are going to be largely concerned, the crown, heads of, the crown heads of Europe are largely going to be concerned with tamping down social and political revolution within uh, their own states. They're going to increasingly be reliant on that developing commercial bourgeois class because they need revenue to finance uh, the increasingly um, complex and large permanent military establishments um, that they're building up. Uh, we had talked about how eventually a common, this was a very, very uh, tense situation. Um, and really, as soon as uh, the 1840s come along and you, you get that series of crises um, uh, tied to uh, the, the agricultural sector, we talked about how the economies are starting to, to merge together. You no longer have just these peasant self-sustaining villages. Um, increasingly, you're growing things for market to sell elsewhere. Your growing staple crops uh, that you can you can move elsewhere. The, the farms are no longer going to be surrounding these little feudal estates where the economy is all largely self-contained. Globalization means that you're increasingly buying manufactured goods from elsewhere, buying other finished products, food goods from elsewhere. Um, and so, when there is the great slump in agricultural uh, activity in the 1840s, and this is tied to the potato blight. Remember, the potato had been brought back. Um, from the Americas, and over the, uh, the following centuries, the following three centuries, it had become a, a main staple crop for especially the poor, and uh, particularly in Ireland. Uh, and so what this is going to do, this potato blight, which is going to destroy the potatoes, if you recall, it's going to drive up the price of food everywhere else. There is then also in France going to be a, uh, a horrible uh, period of flooding, which is going to wipe out um, large amounts of, uh, significant amounts of the, the wheat and barley crop. So this is putting upward pressure on food prices, right? Um, causing a lot of starvation, hunger. Um, at the same time, you have the, the industrialization occurring, right, uh, in the city. So you have increasingly large amounts of, of people migrating to the cities, taking jobs in factories. So they're not even growing food. You know, you might say, well, the farmer is in, is in some big trouble, you know, because he lost part of his crop or something. Well, the people in the cities, as the price of food skyrockets, people stop buying manufactured goods. This means the people who are in the factories are laying people off. There is no welfare state or anything like that at this time. So if you become unemployed, well, you might just starve to death. Like that. You're, you're reliant then on, on charity, uh, you know, the church. Um, the French government actually uh, that's set up uh, following the revolution of 1848 on the Second French Republic, which only lasts a couple of years before it's destroyed by Napoleon's uh, nephew, um, uh, the second French emperor. Uh, they actually set up uh, like a, a, a jobs program uh, where you literally could show up to these national workshops and they would just kind of come up with jobs. It kind of reminds me of uh, you know some of the New Deal programs that they came up with. Uh, FDR's uh, economic advisor, Thomas Sanders, was saying, I don't care if you hire one guy to dig a hole and the other guy to come fill the hole in. The idea is like we just need to get people doing stuff and paying them so that they can spend that money back into the economy and try and get that going. So kind of a mop, kind of a an early Keynesian idea for how to stimulate demand um, by government spending. Um, this is going to drive migration to the United States. You're going to see a huge influx of, of Irish during this time. Um, there was already a significant population of Germans. There's a whole German belt if you look up like sociological literature in the United States. That area from Pennsylvania. Well, you're looking at me this way. Pennsylvania, stretching across the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio, out into the Dakotas. Lots of Germans, lots of Germans there. Um, there's also going to be a lot of war going on at this time. In the years following 1848, if the period 1815 to 1848 saw very little interstate war, there's going to be tons of it in the years following. Um, uh, we're going to probably tackle that in the context of the buildup to World War I, because the process that's going to create a unified Germany, there's not a unified Germany at this point, there are a bunch of little German states. Remember, Napoleon smashes up the Holy Roman Empire and reorganizes it into several smaller, uh, several larger political entities, because it's just easier to deal with uh, you know, one or two heads of state who can then administer an area, rather than having to go and negotiate with a dozen or a hundred different people who rule these tiny little patchwork kingdoms. So uh, that those are all going to be brought together under one 
unified German state uh, by Prussia, and this is going to take place over the course of the uh, period 1848 to 1870. So we're going to talk about that in the context of the build of the World War I, because of course a unified Germany is going to throw off the balance of power on the continent in Europe because a unified Germany is going to be the most populous, the most industrialized, and the wealthiest. Uh, and it also uh, was militarily the most powerful already. If you think about it, Prussia had been very, very small, and yet it was counted as a great power. It could punch well above its weight, and there were several reasons for that. Um, one of which being its highly professionalized uh, general staff. They were the only state at that point that had a literal war planning staff who all they did, like we have a Pentagon today and so it's normal to think about, well, somewhere in the Pentagon, there's a bunch of people sitting around wondering like, if Mexico were to try and invade us, what would we do, right? Like that's totally, and that's probably never going to happen, right? But there is someone whose job it is to contingency plan those types of things, right? So um, you, you have a highly professionalized officer class, right? It's not war starts and, uh, you know, my nephew is the duke and so he gets to command the army. It's not like that. <laughs> and uh, so the fact that they win lots of wars over the next several decades uh, should not be surprising. Um, we talked about uh, the Industrial Revolution. Um, changing, changing really uh, the, the modes of, of, of life. Like we said, now no longer are you going to be doing, uh, making your own clothes, doing things like that, which was a, a lot of what had happened uh, prior to, to the advent of industrialization. Cities, which have always been kind of small affairs, um, not really huge, unless you lived on the coast, where then there'd be a lot of like seaborne commerce going on. Um, the rise of cities and of factory clusters and uh, the, the danger that that's going to pose to governments, of course, right? Because uh, when economic crisis hits or something and you have a lot of unemployed people hanging around, that, that tends to be problematic. Um, and we go down here, we find China and Japan, which is what we're gonna talk about today. I'm not entirely sure why they tag that on the end here. I think it goes kind of better with their next chapter, which is on uh, European imperialism. Um, and uh, just a brief note on imperialism, because I'm going to mention it several times uh, over the course of talking about um, China and uh, Japan and India today. Prior to the 19th century, specifically the late 19th century, imperialism had been an elite project, a policy of high, of high government. Um, this was not something that the ordinary person was really all that involved in, unless maybe you had some shares in the East India Company or something as part of your portfolio, like maybe you had a little bit of money in that. Uh, you know, you, you bought tea, obviously, uh, put sugar in it, so you, it, it was part of your life, but it was very much in the background. It's not as though you wondered, like, well, what should we do about, uh, you know, Singapore? Should we try and, uh, you know, fight the French or do something like that? No, it was just very much in the background. It was, it was raising the standard of living of the people there, but very little thought was given, was given to it, right? Um, it kind of like a, a good example for this might be, uh, like, U.S. policy in, uh, in, the, in the Middle East, in the Gulf region, from like, you know, the 1945 to 1971, when the, when the first oil crisis starts, right? Like that access to tons of cheap oil flowing in from there, like kept, kept uh, raised American living, living standards quite high, right? Think about it, oil was $2 a barrel. Oil was $2 a barrel prior to the formation of the OPEC cartel, when they, got together to raise prices during the 1970s. I mean, oil went from being $2 a barrel to being over $40 a barrel in 10 years. That's an insane jump. It's, it's, and it's the same period, actually, when Japanese car makers start getting huge amounts of market share in the United States. It's because prior to this, Americans didn't have to worry about gas mileage. Gas was so freaking cheap, it didn't matter if your massive Chevrolet burned through tons of gas. It didn't matter. All of a sudden, it was, well, I need a small, fuel-efficient car. Right, and so this is one of the reasons, one of the several reasons that um, that U.S. Uh, auto manufacturers lose a lot of market share there. So, but that's that's what I mean. Like it just kind of went out of the background, and then all of a sudden, gas prices started to go. All of a sudden, Americans were very interested. We're very interested in what was going on over there. Um, kind of the same the same idea, uh, except it was a lot of times governments doing this on purpose as a way to uh, glue the, the societies together. Um, in England, for example, uh, you have the explicit cult of the empire. They make a cult thing, they make an empire day. They have songs about the empire. Uh, you're supposed to take pride and glory in it, um, uh, support the empire. Um, and again, this is a way to 
you know, being fairly cynical, but, you know, distract the people from the fact that, you know, their money is being spent on all of this stuff and, you know, they don't have the vote and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's called social imperialism, by the way. Um, if you're, if you carry on your studies and you find that interesting, that, that phenomenon is called social imperialism. Um, but, China and Japan, so the reason, I, the reason I say that about social imperialism is, is largely because of India. India is going to be the, the centerpiece of the British Empire. Um, we're going to talk today first, though, about China and Japan. Now, if you remember, when we left off China, it was right at the cusp of uh, the, the, the 19th century, right around the year 1800. And if you will recall back, um, the Qing Empire, which had taken over uh, uh, the territory uh, in, a series, in a long series of campaigns against the Ming, who were the last ethnically Han Chinese imperial dynasty. You'll want to remember that because you're going to see that question again. Um, the Qing uh, were a foreign dynasty, if you'll recall. Uh, they were uh, Manchus who had come from the north, and they were facing a lot of internal rebellions. A lot of internal rebellions. And it's around this time, too, that uh, the British start showing up in larger and larger numbers. It's around the year 1800. So we're right, we're right, we're right in the midst of the Napoleonic period now. I'm bringing the Chinese uh, story back in. Uh, so if you're, you'll recall, at this time, still enormously large, enormously powerful, tremendously wealthy, uh, highly advanced, but um, the bureaucracy is having a very hard time maintaining control of these distant regions. There's a lot of corruption, for example, Opium, which is going to play a huge part uh, of our story here, the Opium Wars. Um, you have a lot of bureaucrats uh, who are in control of the, of the ports, of port access and stuff. And so, for example, the the Qing the Qing court had made opium had made opium illegal some thirty years before this. Said, you know what, this is a social ill. You know, it turns people into deadbeats. You know, they don't want to do anything. They're not productive. They're lazy, slothful. It's bad for society. No opium. So they send out the royal edicts and stuff, but you know, you're all the way, <laughs> you're very far away and China's very big. You need to rely on bureaucrats to do your bidding. Well, this bureaucrat who's running this port here in Canton, many hundreds of miles away, the British show up and they say, well, you know, we'll give you a nice back cut of this. Well, who's gonna stop me, right? So of course, that's how the opium is getting into the country. And uh, a lot of these, these bureaucrats actually wind up dabbling in opium themselves to kind of see what's the, what's the big deal here, uh, except that this stuff is highly, highly addictive. I mean, they're smoking, they're smoking raw opium, right? This stuff's highly addictive. So um, that's one huge problem. Uh, another huge problem they're having is uh, the influx of Christianity into the country. Um, this is uh, undermining the uh, I think I had mentioned uh, in the context of our original lectures that um, the, the Chinese state was trying to keep everything within the state. There was not this kind of separation of different spheres. Like, so Christianity, which was, which was forming a separate set of institutions outside of the Chinese imperial state, that, that, was not, that was not an acceptable thing to have. That can be extremely dangerous and erode uh, you know, the, the foundations of, of imperial power. Because Confucianism, of course, had been tied into the state, had been tied into the state, and so uh, trying to keep Christian missionaries out, um, trying to keep British trade out, because you see, uh, the uh, the Chinese had originally been quite keen on having trade uh, with the European powers. If you remember back to our lecture about the Americas, the silver that was being taken out of the Americas was largely winding up in China, in China. Um, because the British wanted, uh, specifically the British, uh, wanted tea. This is where a lot of the tea was coming from. And tea doesn't really surface. The first advertisement for tea uh, doesn't appear in England until the mid-17th century. So it isn't until about the 1650s uh, that you see the first advertisement for tea uh, come around. Of course, that's full of caffeine, which is also highly addictive. Uh, so tea, of course, takes on like gangbusters. Um, and uh, the, the demand for tea is going to fuel the influx of silver into China. And so the government is fine with that. They're running a huge balance of trade surplus. However, the East India Company right next door, you can picture your map in your head, China and India right next to each other. 
Um, opium is increasingly flooding in in exchange for, for tea and for silver. And this is not acceptable. This is damaging the balance of trade. As I said, opium, opium was seen as a, as a social ill. Um, the uh, Chinese government uh, does complain uh, to the British government. Uh, the British government uh, is uneasy about this idea that, oh, well, you know, basically our company here is trafficking in drugs. And there was a very tight relationship between the East India Company and, and the government. Um, but they can't really do anything about it. They can't really do anything about it. Um, India is very far away, right? India is very far away from London. And there's like a whole parallel government that's going on there. Um, and this, recall, this is a, uh, the East India Company. So this is a, this is a, this is not even the British government that is largely in control of India. And I'm, I'm going to, in the later parts of this lecture, explain the British East India Company and, and how that developed. But in terms of China, this is where the opium is coming. The opium is being taken by East, British East India Company agents, processed on offshore islands, and then smuggled into China with the help of, uh, you know, corrupt port officials. Well, eventually. Uh, the, the imperial court, the Qing emperor, is going to send uh, one of his uh, most trusted advisors down to this port. Here he is right here, Lin Zhu. Uh, he is going to, because there's a debate, there's a debate, there's a drug war debate. Some of the court officials say, listen, what we should do, we can't stop the people from smoking them. We already made it illegal. It's been illegal for 50 years and people keep doing it. Why don't we legalize it? and tax it, turn it into a revenue stream for ourselves. And if it's a you know commercially available, we can regulate it, be safer, we'll make money off of it. Uh, Chinese Richard Nixon, however, says, nope, drug war, cracking down hard, coming after him. He goes down to the port, where the British East India Company is more or less doing this business out in the open. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of pounds of opium just chilling in these warehouses, right? So he goes down to the port, looks around and says, okay, clearly you guys haven't been doing what we told you to do. In like a Boston Tea Party fashion, they shove it all into this swamp and he has these, uh, these guys stomp it all into the, uh, into the mud, totally destroying this crop. And we're talking about tens of thousands of pounds. This stuff is worth an unimaginable amount of money. So the British East India Company goes back to London and complains says, listen, I know you're a little queasy about uh, you know, the opium deal, but it was our private property and it was seized from us and destroyed and it cost a lot of money to uh, uh, stockholders in London. Of course, everyone's got their hand in this pie, right? So there's a lot of pressure on the government to do something. You gotta do something. You gotta get at least the Chinese court to pay us back for that so that we can pay our, our, our shareholders back in London. So the British government Sends, war, sends warships, I mean, these are steam-powered warships firing incendiary shells, okay? So these are not just firing, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean like cannonballs. These are firing like semi-modern artillery shells, okay? Uh, the Chinese cities are made of wood. The ships are made of wood with sails and very like medieval cannons. The British absolutely shred. Uh, the Chinese uh, Navy there, they sail up uh, the river and start blasting uh, port cities. This is the first opium war. This is the first opium war, um, which you'll see right here. Uh, this is the, the scene that I've just been describing there with the destruction of the opium. Um, and they impose a treaty. Very quickly, the war is over. The imperial government realizes, look, if we let the British carry on like this, uh, you know, it could seriously destabilize the we just need to end this war. It's not as though uh, this is going well. Maybe we can uh, uh, call up troops and stuff, but that's very socially disruptive as well. Uh, interrupting people's lives, interrupting the harvest, that can you know lead to bad things happening with the food supply. Uh, again, the Qing are already in a very dicey situation. They're dealing with a lot of internal rebellions already, which uh, you're going to see on these slides. I'm actually gonna bring up some slides here. Um, this was the Ming Dynasty that we had been talking about. Here's our Qing Dynasty. So the British are hanging out right down here. Here's India, right? Here's India, sailing them up into here, processing off these islands. Um, here we go, 1760, they're banning the foreign merchants from everywhere else. The opium, banning the opium. Here's the rebellion that we were talking about. Yes, yes, yes. These were from uh, previously. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. The opium wars, oh yes, here we go. So first opium war, 
1839-1842. Those are the treaties that conclude uh, the war. These treaties are going to gain the British some, some interesting things that they're after. Because you see, the British aren't after ruling China. They don't want to put tons of troops in China. Why don't they want to put tons of troops in China? Well, number one, China's way too big to militarily occupy. Number two, putting troops on the ground costs tons of money. It's actually ironic given what we're going to talk about with the eventual conquest of, the, of all of India by the British East India Company. The original director, the original founder of the East India Company, when they first sailed over to those spice islands, took a look around and said, well, the Portuguese and the Dutch are doing this all wrong. You see, by having forts and troops there, you're cutting into your profits there. What you want to do is have no garrisons, no military footprint. You just want to trade. You just take pure profit. So it's kind of ironic what wound up happening. But so what they're after here with these treaties are commercial concessions. They say, listen, if you want us to stop bombarding you and disrupting uh, what's going on here, we want lots more ports open, doing business through one port. You can imagine the backlog. Right? You can imagine the backlog. It's taking forever to get things in and out of there. We want a lot more ports open. Number two, we want our merchants to be able to go to and fro without being harassed by you know, officials. Where are your papers? Let me check this cargo. Slowing things down. Impeding trade. There's a lot of pressure on them to, uh, on the British government to get access to, Christ access to China for Christian missionaries. It's the most populous state in the world at this point, and it was uh, just until recently, India overtook uh, China here not that long ago. But these are all non-Christian people. Um, the Protestant uh, ethic is uh, very missionary, very evangelical. They want access, uh, free and unconstrained access. We talked about this in, in the context of our, of our original lecture on, uh, on China, which was that the emperor did not want uh, the, the Christian missionaries in there. Uh, so they're going to get access to them. They're also going to get uh, extraterritoriality. Extraterritoriality, what does that mean? That means that if I am an Englishman, and I am in China, and I commit a crime, the Chinese government does not have the legal authority to prosecute me. They have to report me to a local British authority who can then come and arrest me and take me and try me in a British court. Um, second opium war, so essentially, the Second Opium War is really just fought because uh, the British are not pleased with how slow the Chinese Imperial Court is about implementing all of these things. Because the Chinese government signs the treaty and then is kind of foot dragging about it. You know, kind of scheming like, well, you know, next time they come, they will do this, that. You know, they don't want to do these things because these are going to be highly, highly disruptive. Um, both to the society and the economy. And so they're, they're very much foot-dragging implementation, you know, harassing British traders and stuff. And so the second opium war is essentially fought by the British who come back and say, no, listen, seriously, this is what's going to happen. And so this time, uh, 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 the Treaty of Tianjin is signed. This is going to not only guarantee the rights that were originally negotiated, it's also going to open up uh, China for the other European powers who are going to demand equal access. This second opium war is going to be uh, a coalition project. The French are going to send troops. The Americans are going to send troops. The Russians are going to get in on the action. Everyone's getting in on the action. They realize that China is the largest market there is. You can read these. Uh, you can read these tracks about you know these uh, these manufacturers in, in uh, you know England and stuff saying. Hundreds of millions of Chinese. Imagine if each of them bought only a handful of buttons. You know, it's basically the idea being like, you know, they're only penny, you know, they're only a few copper pennies or whatever. But you know, if a hundred million Chinese all bought them, you know, we'd be rich. It's funny because uh, in the 1980s, when China was uh, creating a state capitalist model, you have the exact same debates happening in American corporations in the 1980s. Like, just imagine, there's a billion Chinese over there. What if they all bought just like one pair of Nikes or something? And so, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Background to multiple rebellions. All of this warfare that's going on, remember we talked about the, the, the idea of the mandate of heaven, right? Bad things start happening. Rebellions are breaking out all the time. Coups, basically looks like the Qing Empire isn't long for the making, right? Isn't long for the lasting. The British recognize this. The British recognize this. 
And ironically, you have this, this bizarre process going on. The, the British are going to fight and defeat the Qing in multiple wars here, right? And then they're going to turn around and start fighting the enemies of the Qing Empire in China with the Qing. So for example, there's going to be a, a massive rebellion, Taiping Rebellion. It's going to kill something like 20 to 30 million people right in the middle of the 1850s, 1860s. So the US Civil War is going on. We lose about 600, 700,000 uh, people, you know, a great tragedy, you know, it takes many, many decades for, for the nation to heal from that. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of people being killed here. And I'm talking like whole city just being put to the sword. Well, there's guns now at this point, but you know what I mean, put to the sword, sitting to the um, The British realized that, oh my gosh, if the Qing Empire falls apart, China's going to fragment into a bunch of lawless zones, and it's just gonna be a huge mess. We're never gonna be able to do business in China. Better to keep the Qing Empire together, let them have the police power internally, but if a rebellion crops up and they can't handle it, we'll come in and help them put it down. And this happens multiple times. The Russians will help them, the French will help them. Um, eventually, the European powers start cutting in to China. I'm just gonna show you a map here. Um, so this is uh, China right here, the, the Qing Empire. This is the White Lotus Rebellion that was taking place in the, in the 1790s that we had talked about. This was one of the first signs of, of real trouble at the end of the 18th century. As you can see, uh, they're, they're losing large chunks of territory. I'm going to use my laser here, just because I don't want to be in front of that. So as you can see here, uh, Manchuria is going to be uh, lost to the Russians because the Russians are going to throw, I'm going to go back there in a second, but the Russians are going to take a big slice. Um, Korea, which was a tributary kingdom, that's going to be taken by Japan in the uh, first Sino-Japanese War in the 1890s. That's when uh, Taiwan, Formosa, is also going to go to Japan as well during that conflict. Um, Taiwan had been, uh, Formosa had been incorporated into the, the Chinese kingdom uh, right around the time of the American Revolution, actually. It had been kind of a tributary, peripheral uh, aspect of, of, the, of the Chinese sphere of influence, and they officially incorporated, well, they're gonna lose it about a century and a half later to the Japanese. Uh, and then, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, these are, these are zones of influence here. Basically, uh, you have all these powers carving out like little kingdoms for themselves. So like French Indochina, right? French Indochina, um, modern day Vietnam, right? So the French are just going to come in here and take this nice rich area. And they're going to try and hold on to it uh, till the bitter end in the, in the 1950s uh, when they're finally driven out after uh, Dien Bien Phu. Uh, which, gosh, what a dumb place for a fort. If you're not familiar with them, they literally have this fort right in smack in the middle of these massive hills. What a dumb place for a fort, right? Because then you don't have the high jumps. They can just rain, rain fired on, which is exactly what happens. Um, yes, one of the most famous uh, uprisings that the powers help put down is the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion. I'm going to go back here. Um, Boxer Rebellion. Did I put it on here? I didn't. I didn't put the Boxer Rebellion. Yes, the Boxer Rebellion is 1898. 1898. And as you can see, this instability, the background to these rebellions, these are put down. All of these rebellions are put down either by the Qing or by the Qing with the European powers. This last one here, the Boxer Rebellion. Um, it's a complicated one. It essentially, what you had were uh, Chinese nationalists, um, Han Chinese nationalists, who both despised the Qing for being weak collaborator foreigners, and who also despised the Europeans, and who wanted to basically drive them out and remove the Qing from power. Um, at this point, the Qing uh, dynasty is, is growing increasingly unstable, increasingly un unable to, to defend itself. Um, Beijing is going to be occupied by the foreign powers. They're going to extract this massive indemnity from them. Um, it's, it's kind of the, the real beginning of the end. Um, the Chinese empire will collapse uh, 10 years on from this, um, 1911, 1912. This was the Qing sigil. You know what a huge fan of vexillology I am. Love the flags. This was the Qing. This was the original flag of the, the short-lived Chinese Republic right here before adopting this. 
And who knows where this flag can still be found today? Anybody? Taiwan. Taiwan, precisely. Taiwan. It was originally the flag of the Republic of China. So, that is China um, in the 19th century, the beginning of the century of humiliation. Remember, China has been the largest, most advanced, most prosperous state uh, human civilization had had, had uh, through, through the centuries, certainly since we've been talking. We started our, ch our chats in, in about the, the high medieval period, you know, 1100, 1200. I mean, Europe is hopelessly, hopelessly backward and poor compared to China at this point. And it's only now uh, that uh, the European powers were taking them, and that's due to industrialization. Um, then uh, industrialized uh, powers are going to take advantage of these, uh, frankly, you know, no negative connotation here, but like, you know, frankly, not progressive powers. I mean, we're talking about uh, states that uh, just had not uh, industrialized sufficiently, had not professionalized their armies in the same way. And frankly, in the case of, of China, uh, it wasn't as though the British uh, and the French were encountering a strong unified China, right? You had a China that was being ruled by a non-ethically Han Chinese imposed foreign dynasty where everyone was trying to uh, shirk them off anyway. So um, much the same thing is going to happen in India. In India. Ooh, I have to talk about Japan. Mm, I'm actually going to jump to talking about India first because I've been mentioning India a lot. Okay, so India was the same way, right? The British show up and there's just, uh, there's no political unit. The Indian nationalism, hard not to read history backwards and say, this was India. India, as a centralized political entity, like we know today, had never existed. Had never existed. The British imperialists are kind of right when they say that they invented India. They took all these hundreds of disparate kingdoms and princely areas and whatnot, and they fused them into one administrative region. That had never happened before. Um, uh, so the closest they had come was the, uh, the Mughals, the Mughals, which again, the Mughals too were foreign. These had been Central Asian uh, Muslim invaders, if you'll recall. We had talked about that. That actually is a picture from one of the slides from the lecture on it. And they're going to come in in the uh, early 16th century and set up a dynasty that's going to, to last until the British get there. But again, when the British get here, you have lots of uh, princes who are very happy to collaborate in fighting against their nominal lords, the Mughals, right? Who are not like the Mughals, foreign dynasty. You have the same thing going on in China. So I find it very interesting that uh, a lot of these colonial powers were, these imperial powers were able to exploit differences within the societies that they were encountering. Same with Cortez, right? Cortez uses the other native tribes against uh, the Aztecs, right? Um, and this goes all the way back to, if you ever read uh, Julius Caesar's Chronicles, uh, the Gaelic Chronicles, um, he talks about uh, using divide and rule, right? There's one tribe that's more powerful than the other tribes, the other tribes resent them, so you can come in and offer yourself as help to drive out these other guys. Um, and this is exactly what's happening here. So, what happens here? I had said in the start that, that the, the East India Company, the trading company that's set up, um, didn't want to rule India, but eventually they would. What happened? Okay, so first, the East India Company. It was one of the first joint stock companies. Joint stock companies. Today we think of them as you know as common as water. Don't think twice about them. This was a very radical invention, and it was a way of diffusing risk. Let's imagine for a moment that we are sitting there in, in the year 1500, and uh, you've got a good amount of gold built up, and uh, you know that if you sail over to those spice islands over there, you can turn your 3,000 pound investment into 30,000 pounds. That sounds pretty good, right? That's a thousand percent profit, right? Problem is, problem is, you're going to have to sail a ship off into the you know far reaches across many oceans, get there, hopefully not be killed, or have pirates attack you, and then you have to turn around and sail all the way back, right? risky, right? Kind of risky. Don't really want to put all 3,000 pounds of your life savings into that, right? But what if someone comes to you and says, listen, for 10 pounds, 
you can have 1% or half a percent of the return on this uh, voyage that we're going to do. We're getting a bunch of guys together, a bunch of gals together. Everybody's just chipping in a little bit, and then everybody gets a little share. This is a modern corporation, right? When you buy a share of Ford Motor Company, many of you own like equities or stocks or anything like that, right? Like you're buying a small, you're taking on, you don't think of it that way, but like you're buying some of the risk that Ford is going to go bankrupt and you get nothing in exchange for the promise that Ford is not going to go bankrupt and they're going to make money and they're going to pay you a little dividend, right? So this was a new invention at this time, a joint stock company. It was a way of diffusing risk and getting more people to participate in market activities. Remember, Columbus wanted badly to try and sail out and go find stuff, but he couldn't find anyone to finance his journey because, oh gosh, this sounds so risky and, you know, that's a lot of money, all these ships, men, you know, you get to go to a crown head of Europe. Well, there's only so many of those, and they can only finance so many journeys. It'd be better if you could tap in to the multitude, right? But they don't have the money individually to finance them, and it's too risky anyway. So you sell them a little bit of it. You sell them a little bit of it. And so uh, the East India, the British East India Company is one of these. And what you're doing is the, the British East India Company is getting a monopoly. So the, the basically, you have a board of directors, they go to the government and they say, um, we would like uh, to buy the rights to have trade in India, and no one else can do it, we're the only ones. The government says, okay, we get a cut of it, and then uh, you know they go out, they find investors, investors buy into the company, they sail out, they hopefully do some good business and make it back, and then they pay the government their cut, and they pay all their share their shareholders, some of it as well. So that's how that works, and that's what the British East Indian Company was. It was the company that had the right to trade in India. So. They show up, they find that there is a uh, foreign dynasty, the Mughals, ruling uh, much of the northern part of India. Uh, there are lots of uh, little princely, quasi-independent client states in the south, and uh, the British go to them and say, listen, we'd like to set up some, some trading ports. And, uh, you know, they, uh, it's in Madras, Calcutta, and Bombay that they eventually set up shop, the British do. Uh, first, they have to kill some Portuguese and fight some Spaniards and stuff, so. There's a little bit of European fighting going on, but then the British are fairly quickly ensconced in there by the early 1600s, so well before the start of our story today. So, um, then what happens? Well, again, there's a lot of resentment. There's a lot of resentment toward the Mughal court in the north. And so as the British grow wealthier and more powerful, they start looking around and saying, gosh, you know, a lot of riches to be had here. You know, if we could move north, do some more trade up there. Some of the local elites, some of the princes who are collaborating with them say, well, we heard that there's this prince uh, in the northwest of the country who would totally be down to throw off the, the Mughals and stuff. And so the, the British essentially start building this, this coalition of independent allies to undermine the Mughal rule, which is already unpopular and weakening anyway. And uh, there's never more than you know several thousand British men there at any time. So. They're vastly outnumbered. The majority of the fighting is being done by uh, the people of the subcontinent, uh, whether they be Sikhs, whether they be uh, you know uh, Central Asian uh, Muslims, or whether they be they be Indians. So um, that is what happens. The 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 the, the British East India Company uh, is is a highly sought after ally. After all, um, they are a modern military being sent from Europe. These these trading companies were highly militarized. Think about it, just because London told you that you could come do this, um, London is very far away. The Royal Navy is very far away. You have to be able to fight and defend yourself, right? And so these companies were highly militarized. I mean, they had their own fleets, they had their own armies. And these were highly professionalized, highly drilled and equipped European armies. So if you think about, uh, you know, having several thousand men trained in European warfare, landing there, this is a very powerful ally that you could have. If you were a local prince or something who wanted to cut into your neighbor's territory, who wanted to push back against the, the imperial authorities, this is a force that for hire, because they are opportunistic capitalist entrepreneurs, fighting is just another job, right? If the money is good enough and these princes had tons of money, sure they do it. And that's exactly what happens. Uh, they wind up getting, they wind up getting, I wouldn't say sucked in, they are enticed in by the offer of money and reward, and that is what they do. Uh, and they fight a series of wars, which culminate in 1757. 
1757 with the Battle of Plassey. Battle of Plassey. This results in uh, virtually uh, the destruction uh, of the last remnants of, of Mughal imperial authority. And all that's left after that is a collection of hundreds of different small independent principalities. The British East India Company uh, possesses uh, uh, the strongest independent force. And so uh, what they're going to do is gradually over time expand their, their hold uh, over, the, over the territory until 1857. And what's been happening here is they've been essentially bribing guys in. Um, there's a local prince, and you say, look, uh, you know, the Mughals are gone, we're here. Listen, we will let you stay prince of your hereditary fiefdom here, but we expect you to pay tribute to soldiers, don't cause any problems. If we have any administrative regulations, you're going to follow through on those. Administrative regulations, what do I mean? Well, when the British arrived in India, they encountered several practices that they found kind of objectionable, frankly. Um, the burning of widows, for example. When a man died, uh, they built a pyre, and then they took his wife, who was still living, and would tie her up and put her on the funeral pyre and burn her alive with her husband. The British found this highly objectionable. There was also a lot of like child marriage going on. Again, the British found this highly objectionable. And they started outlawing these things as they became more powerful. And this would create pushback, it would cause problems, and you know, the British would sometimes resort to like massacring people if they, you know, to make an example, uh, to say, listen, this is what's going to happen now, and you're going to stop doing this, you're going to start doing this. Um, the introduction of Christianity, they start trying to introduce Christianity, which is ironic because one of the things that had really undermined Mughal authority and Mughal rule was that originally they had said religious toleration. Hindus can be Hindus, we'll be Muslims, no problem. They start trying to forcibly convert the Indian population to Islam, is one of the things that starts really creating pushback. It's one of the things that really starts creating pushback against British rule. And again, this is East India Company rule. Until 1857. In 1857, there was a massive mutiny. Um, again, people reading history backwards, if you Google like the first Indian War of Independence, you'll see them reference this. But again, India didn't exist, right? These were not people raising some tricolor Indian flag saying, we're gonna fight for independent India. No. They were mostly just, they mostly hated the British at this point and wanted to drive them out. And there was a series of military garrisons. Sepoys, that was the name for the Indian troops who fought on the side of the British. So they introduced these new rifle cartridges and uh, the British had thought they came up with an ingenious idea because India has a very wet climate, oftentimes. And what happens to uh, metal, exposed metal? Yeah. And rust, what happens to powder? Does powder work well when it's, when it's wet? No, it doesn't. So what they did is they took the bullet and the powder and the casing and they wrapped it in this oiled paper. And what you would do is you would open your breech loader, bite off this piece of oiled paper, and then put the cartridge in, okay? Well, rumors went around that uh, the, the, the oil, that the, wet, that the oil that was on the paper was either beef fat or pork fat, which would be taboo to both Muslims and Indians. And so this, this, uh, this regiment of sea boys refused to use the cartridges. And instead of just taking a step back and wondering, you know, can we maybe try to explain things? Instead, the British officers in charge have these guys, this, this whole regiment of sea boys, ceremonially abused and whipped and thrown in a, in a, in a jail. And uh, the rest of the troops mutiny overnight, free them, slaughter all the British people they can find, and the mutiny is on. There's a huge fight. Um, and uh, the British barely hold on. And in the aftermath, um, London essentially closed down the company. They essentially closed down the company. And this is the establishment of the Raj. And the British Raj is going to come in. This is when the Imperial Service is going to come in. And they're going to make some changes. They're going to say, okay, um, enough with trying to Christianize the population, enough with trying to take away these territories from these feudal princes. This was another thing that was causing problems is the East India Company started to think, well, you know, uh, Prince so-and-so is about to die, and I know we made an agreement with him that he could be in charge there, but, you know, we made that agreement with him, you know, we're paying him a little salary, really it'd be better if we just step in there. Instead of letting this title pass to his son, well, let's just go ahead and take it. Highly unpopular, highly unpopular. The British Raj comes in and says, just forget about that. We'll take control of the port cities down here, we'll run the central administration, but as long as these local princes will, will play ball, uh, we'll just let them stay in power. Um, 
These are going to be the people, by the way, who the uh, Indian National Congress, which like Gandhi, that's you know um, about mm, about seventy years in, in the future here, eighteen twenties or nineteen twenties. These are actually the native uh, uh, class that the uh, the for the India now, the independent India now movement is going to be pushing back against because these entrenched uh, you know, collaborators, for lack of a better word, aren't going to want the system to change because they benefit from it. So it's, it's interesting to note that, that when, when, uh, when people like Gandhi are trying to uh, free India, get an independent India, they are also pushing back against some of their own, own country. Very quickly, very quickly, Japan. I promise to do more on Japan. Um, Japan has not been a central part of this story at all. Uh, Japan was highly insular. Um, it is an island. Uh, it had a great uh, contact. It had a lot of influence from uh, from the mainland, but it was also uh, not something that could be easily conquered and held. Um, it's a it's a large mountainous chain of islands, and uh, so um, the one attempt, the one very large scale attempt uh, to invade the island by the Mongols. If you remember when the Mongols were on just that ferocious tear in the 13th century, just taking over everything, they tried to invade Japan. They they built this massive fleet. Um, which was highly unusual for them, right? They were not <laughs> known to the great seagoing people, so this was kind of a reach. Uh, they sail out there, and their fleet gets smashed to pieces uh, by the storm, uh, which the Japanese called the kamikaze, the divine wind, where kamikaze comes from, saves the, 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 the emperor. Um, it actually wasn't the emperor who did a lot of the fighting. It was these shoguns. These were like military chieftains, local nobility, basically, who could raise large amounts of retainers. And so what happens is you have this period right here, the shogunate. So you have rule by the emperor till about 1200, and this is uh, you know exactly what it sounds like. You have this administrative bureaucracy that the emperor basically maintains, puts people in place. Well, in the aftermath of these conflicts um, that were largely won by the shoguns, these military chieftains, because yes, it's all well and good to run some good central administrative stuff and have trade and things like that, but when you're actually under threat, it's better to have people who can fight and raise troops. And they decide to keep uh, keep control of uh, of the of the government. The shoguns have a class of warriors called samurai. These are their retainers. These are like their knights. So if you want to think of the shoguns as like the lords, they have their knights, which are the samurai. They're going to be in charge until uh, the 1868 Meiji Restoration, which is uh, a revolution. It's a revolution because what happens? Japan is highly insular, highly insular. In the 1850s, an American admiral named Matthew Perry of Friends fame, he just recently died, you probably saw that, just kidding. Commodore Perry shows up with these iron-sided ships with cannons, and he says, hey, we would like to do some trading with you. Now, we don't want this to get messy, okay? We don't like what the British do, where they come in and set up shop and colonize you and take over, we don't wanna do that. But also, if you don't open up, well, just watch what these cannons can do. And they literally, like, have them set up like an area of like uninhabited houses and they just blast them all to pieces to like show the Japanese like, for real, we mean business. So what's it gonna be? So they come back a year later after the Japanese government has debated and the Japanese government decides, we'll just let them come trade. We'll just let them come trade. There had only been one trading post. It had been kind of a similar situation to what had been going on in China where they had the one trading post but the Chinese were, but the Japanese were even more tightly controlled about it than that. There was only one power who was allowed to do the trading, and it had to take place offshore. So it's not that there was no trade, but you could not be a foreigner and be in Japan. Like you'd be killed, um, and that was just policy. Uh, this is going to change, though, and all of a sudden, Western uh, influence, technology, ideas, all of that is going to start flooding into Japan in the span of about 15 years. And there's going to be incredible debates that go on within uh, Japanese uh, high government circles. And it's so fantastic because we have so much of this stuff uh, still on paper that, that, that scholars have been able to look at, to collate, to put into books. And uh, the, the Japanese uh, ruling class essentially come to the conclusion that we can either dominate or be dominated. So we're going to uh, absorb Western culture as fast as we can and industrialize as fast as we can so that we can be a great power too. Because they're looking at what's happening to China, next door China, which had been this immortal, large, big brother type power that just crumbles in the face, seemingly crumbles in the face of just a handful of Europeans. 
wielding these new technologies and new forms of government. And so the Japanese will bring in uh, Prussian advisors to help them set up a military, they'll set up a constitution. All of these things, this is the Meiji Restoration, this is a professionalized bureaucracy. And 30 years later, they are going to defeat China in a war and take over uh, Formosa and Korea. A few years after that, they're going to defeat Russia in a war, the Russo-Japanese War. So you have to think, this was 50 years before that, it was samurais and no guns or anything like that, right? Basically feudal society. 50 years later, they're defeating the Chinese and the Russians in wars. Um, so the fastest learners um, uh, imaginable, uh, the Prussia of the East is, is what it's often called. Um, there is going to be, if you've ever seen the movie Last Samurai, have you ever seen that movie? The Last Samurai? This right here, the Satsuma Rebellion, that was the rebellion of the samurai, uh, which is put down by uh, rifle fire. Uh, it kind of reminds me of the Janissaries, if you remember the Janissaries, who were the, uh, the warrior class of the Ottoman Empire. They were losing their position as the, the, as the, the sultan, in this case the emperor, was creating a modern army, one that was built on firepower, gunpowder weapons, peasants raised into soldiers, degrading the warrior class, you know, um, cutting into their power, right? Um, they're going to revolt. Uh, the emperor's uh, army is going to be put in the field, and they're just going to just destroy these samurai with artillery and rifle fire and kill them all. Um, and that's the end of it, just like uh, the Jan series, if you remember. So, um, Japan is obviously going to play a huge part in our story going forward. Japan is going to rise to become the power in Asia. Um, let's see, fast forwarding a little bit here, so we're right about where are we at? So we're in the, we're right about the turn of the century. Is that where we want to be? Okay, we're right about the year 1900. I just want to make sure we're all in the same place here. So China, the Qing Empire is crumbling. Its territory is being taken away. The emperor is about to be driven out by revolution. In Japan, Japan had its doors broken down, but quickly modernized and was able to fight back and is already, at, by the year 1900, carving out its own imperial sphere. And then in India, you have a still highly fragmented, highly differentiated subcontinent, but which is now under the rule of the British government, and this is called the Raj, the British Raj. So you have two periods of British rule. You have the East India Company rule, which ends in 1857 following a mutiny, and then you have the British Raj, which will last until uh, 1947, when the British Empire is basically folded up following World War II. Okay, any questions? No, all right, you are free to go. Have a great rest of the day. I will see you all on Thursday, where we will talk about the expansion of the European Empire in the 19th century.